in some previous videos, I've talked about several aspects of several old books in a single video. This time, I wanted to focus on one book, uh, so a real, like, deep dive into a single volume. One of the things that booksellers look for when they buy a particular copy of a book is some special or unique attribute about that copy, something that tells an interesting and compelling story that we can flush out in a catalog description, because that's really what interests clients, uh, collectors, librarians, uh, and of course uh, the cataloger, because you have to enjoy what you're cataloging and learn from it. That's the fun of bookselling. One of the things I focus on immediately is the provenance of the book, the previous ownership, who owned it, where it came from, how it traveled through time. Uh, we're fortunate in the rare book world that there's often evidence of provenance uh, in a book. You can find book plates or ownership inscriptions. Uh, I'm not talking about, however, rather ordinary provenance here. Uh, you can find a lot of aristocratic book plates, book plates of noblemen, and whether it's, I don't know, the, uh, the 13th Earl of Cavendish or uh, the uh, second dog of the uh, twice removed of the Duke of Devonshire. Uh, just ad living noble people there. That is not uh, what I'm talking about because that's certainly worthy of noting in a catalog description but it doesn't really necessarily increase the value of the book or tell a uh, compelling story. This book, however, has the, the type of provenance a bookseller loves to find, and I certainly will discuss that in a moment. But before I do, let's talk a little bit about the book itself. Ye Ornamenti delle Donne, printed in Venice in 1562. This is one of the earliest and most important works of the, in the Renaissance on cosmetics. Uh, now, we don't have a lot of beauty manuals that have come down to us uh, from the Renaissance, so we're quite fortunate that this is a rare surviving type in its genre. Uh, the book uh, was written by Giovanni Marinello, a 16th century physician and natural philosopher. When I went to a uh, debate at Oxford years ago, uh, they had on the floor the question, which is more important, the art of the old masters or the art uh, of today? And somebody said rather succinctly and eloquently in favor of the art of today, if Botticelli were alive today, he would be working for Vogue. Uh, so it's very similar if I could say, you know, if. Uh, Chloe Kardashian or Michelle Fan were uh, alive during the Renaissance, uh, they would be writing a beauty manual like this. Uh, the book has some very surprising elements uh, in it that I discovered, at least, uh, when I was reading through it. For instance, there is a chapter on the whitening of teeth, uh, which I did not expect, a sort of a proto-crest white strips to get that L.A. gleaming smile. Uh, there were sections on how to lose weight, as well as sections on how to gain weight. Uh, so you really had your choice uh, whether you wanted to be uh, a uh, Venetian Twiggy, or if you wanted to be a voluptuous model for Donnier in a Titian painting. One of the things that I like most about it are the extensive sections, I think it's at least 20 recipes on uh, the bleaching of hair, if you want to go blonde. Uh, evidently, Venetian women preferred blondes. Uh, I can sort of understand that. Uh, there were depictions of Helen of Troy, of this idolized beauty with blonde hair, and even Petrarch uh, described Laura as having uh, flowing waves, flowing golden waves, uh, caressing down her neck. So certainly an interest in going blonde. Uh, you may be thinking uh, that this uh, superficial attainment of beauty uh, had a little bit of uh, anti-feminism to it. But interestingly enough, the daughter of Giovanni Marinello, Lucrezia uh, Marinello, was an important uh, 
a female writer during the period, and she wrote one of the early proto-feminist works on the uh, nobility and excellence of women and uh, the defects and vices of men. So I could certainly agree with the first part wholeheartedly and the uh, second part I sort of half agree with. So a very interesting work uh, in and of itself. Now I said I would talk about the provenance of the work. Well, as I was cataloging it, I noticed right away on the back of the title page here a stamp, uh, semi-calligraphic almost, or italicized, given by Henry Howard of Norfolk. Uh, the story with this really starts uh, slightly earlier with Thomas Howard, who was the 14th Earl of Arundel, and he was known as the Collector's Earl for his voracious appetite for collecting things, whether old masters, drawings, paintings, uh, artifacts, sculptures, books, manuscripts, jewelry, you name it. He was on par even with some of the great collectors of the period, like Charles, King Charles I. And you can even visit the famous Arundel Marbles at the uh, Ashmolean today. But, uh, as is often the case, the heirs to an estate do not share the same passion and vision as the original collector. And sure enough, uh, his grandson, Henry Howard, the Duke of Norfolk, inherited the collection. Uh, John Evelyn, the famous English diarist of the period, uh, left us with a uh, very interesting literary nugget in one of his uh, diaries where he describes Henry Howard as negligent uh, toward books. Uh, but for the benefit of posterity, he did convince uh, Duke to uh, donate the library to the Royal Society here, and we see that on the stamp. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, the Royal Society is the preeminent scientific institution in England, uh, you know, formed by Royal Charter under Charles II in 1660. And when you think of the society, you have to think of uh, Robert Boyle and Christopher Wren and, of course, Isaac Newton. Uh, so certainly people you want to share a breakfast discussion with. You can see here the original book plate of the Royal Society with its wonderful uh, motto, uh, Nullius in Verbo, which sort of translates as uh, trust, uh, don't take the word of anybody. Uh, and what they intended that as was a reminder uh, that you should not trust the word of the government or nobleman, but you should really uh, obtain the truth uh, through scientific experimentation. Uh, so trust the data, uh, and there's a wonderful book play there. One thing I have to say I love about this book is I sort of fantasize who touched and used this book in such an important library like the Royal Society, whether Newton held the book in his hand even for a moment. Uh, of course, uh, that could only be male scientists because I don't think women were admitted to the society until uh, the 1940s or so. Why is the book still not in the Royal Society Library? Well, in the 1920s, uh, for space considerations during moving, uh, they decided to deaccession and sell a considerable number of books through Sotheby's. And we see the stamp here, Royal Society Sold. The librarian at the time made the criteria for deciding which books could go or stay, that they would keep books of pure scientific interest. So this did not make the cut, even though from a modern perspective, we certainly would consider books on health regimens and recipes uh, to be of scientific interest. And if you've watched any uh, makeup application videos on YouTube, you certainly know the scientific precision uh, with which makeup is applied. Uh, the sale was very controversial, as is often the case uh, when a fine institution deaccessions important books from their collection for whatever purposes. Uh, and this is certainly a fine example of an interesting book that would serve to enliven uh, that uh, important discussion or debate. Uh, the book is rather modest looking. It's in a rather utilitarian, simple vellum uh, with what we call a yak. Uh, edges, but as I said, this is a book that I was delighted to buy because of the rich and compelling story it says, and so many angles to explore, whether you're interested in cosmetics of the period or you're interested in the 
intersection of beauty and feminism during the Renaissance, or like I said, you wanted to explore uh, the Royal Society or even uh, when and why uh, it is acceptable for institutions to uh, deaccession you know, things from their collections. So really a book that has everything, uh, you know, for a bookseller, uh, I would say everything except a spine. So uh, thank you uh, so much for watching and I look forward to sharing uh, videos in the future and discussing uh, rare books and the rare book uh, world uh, and be sure to subscribe.